You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, just recently, on September the 25th, 1995, this last Monday to be exact, John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, appeared before the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. What he said will astound you. John McGaw is the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the very agency that we exposed in our headline story as being engaged in massive constructive fraud against the American people in the last issue of Veritas, issue number six. During his speech to the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., John McGaw made some incredible admissions. One is called the Outreach Program, where they cooperate with and assist local law enforcement across the country. Absolutely against <laughs> every concept that Americans have held since the beginning of this nation. Absolutely, 100% outside of any jurisdiction or venue that they may even think that they have to operate within the 50 states. And we documented that in the law, in the statutes at large, in the Code of Federal Regulations, and, ladies and gentlemen, in the United States Code. Now, this program is going to re-air on Saturday, September the 30th, 1995, at 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time. That's 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time. And in case you don't know how to tell what time it is where you're at, on the East Coast, that would be 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That would be 4 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time and 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. That's this Saturday tomorrow, as a matter of fact, the 30th of September, Saturday, at 3 Pacific, 4 Mountain, 5 Central, and 6 Eastern Daylight Time. The main part of this speech is going to be about the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Cooperation with and assistance to local law enforcement across the country. Also, lots of stuff about Waco and the Oklahoma City bombing, especially in the question and answer section after he 
finishes with his speech. You should all record this. It is extremely interesting, and there's one major admission that you're going to hear tonight. In fact, you're going to hear it over and over again tonight, so that through all the baloney out there on shortwave, you'll get at least one good recording of it. It is important that you do this. One of the questions asked was, quote, did the hearings about the militias serve any useful purpose, and should militia members have been given a forum? End quote. John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, replied, and I quote, Well, I believe they do serve a useful purpose, and I was kind of hoping we could have one every week because of some of the muck, some of the things they say that would inform the public and that would help us better than anything else, end quote. And later in the same question and answer section, this question was asked, quote, Has the influence of militia members in this country been overplayed? Or are militias a powerful citizen's voice? End quote. John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, answered thusly, quote, Well, I think militias can be a powerful citizen's voice. I think in the past... In some of the training that they do, some of the kinds of things that they have been known for in the past can be very constructive. When they cross that line, and when they stockpile weapons, they stockpile explosives, they experiment with bombs, those kinds of things, then that crosses the line. And I'm not saying that, I'm not identifying that any militia could do that, I'm just saying but in themselves, the militia in itself, in its normal circumstances, is not a destructive unit. It's what its members do. In fact, many years ago, they defended this very republic. They're not needed now, though. We have the National Guard. And they're getting into areas and doing things that I think are a detriment to law enforcement and civil liberties. End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. Now, just in case it was difficult for some of you to make that out, and I'm going to play it over and over again to make sure that you understand what it was that he said. This is John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And he says that if the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms had been left in charge at the Waco incident, as he calls it, they would not have burned that building. Not referring to the Branch Davidians, but referring to himself, his agency, which means, ladies and gentlemen, what he is telling us is that the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, burned the building known as the Church of the Branch Davidians, or as the Branch Davidians called it, Mount Carmel. Listen to it again. This is John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, 
uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. Very clearly, ladies and gentlemen, John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, said this, and I quote, If we had been left in charge of the Waco incident, we would not have burned that building. End quote. This is an incredible admission that the government burned the building known as Mount Carmel. It is an admission that what we have told you happened all along is exactly what did happen. And folks, if it wasn't true, the night that I announced that if we did not stop what was going on in Waco, Texas, during the Waco siege, they were going to murder all of those people known as the Branch Davidians. They would never have burned down the radio station, WWCR. It was burned down that very night after I made that statement. Listen to John McGall, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, again. And listen carefully and make sure that you're recording this, ladies and gentlemen, and make sure that you don't miss the rebroadcast of his speech tomorrow on C-SPAN. The speech by John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, before the National Press Club, which originally took place Monday, September 25th, 1995, will re-air tomorrow, Saturday, September the 30th, 1995, at 3 Pacific, 4 Mountain, 5 p.m. Central, and 6 Eastern Daylight Time, where he says this, where he makes this incredible statement. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that you understand what you're listening to. I hope that you're not one of those people who, in light of everything that's been presented to you over the years, are still going to slough this off as some kind of a mistake. Men like John McGaw do not make these kinds of mistakes, ladies and gentlemen. What he says is what he means. Freudian slip, maybe? Absolutely. No doubt about that. I am sure if he had it to do all over again, he would not have made such an incriminating admission. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. Still struggling to get a handle on exactly what it is that he is saying? It's very clear, ladies and gentlemen. He says, and I quote, I believe that if we had been left in charge of the Waco incident, we would not have burned that building, end quote. Nothing could be more clear or more devastating or more incriminating. Nothing <laughs> that they could ever say or do besides pull another Waco, could justify any better than that the reason for the forming of the militia, the reason for broadcasts like mine, the reason for people out there like you, the loyal listeners to the Hour of the Time, who have studied for many years and who know exactly what's going on. These people are true sociopaths. They have no conscience. They have no guilt. They believe that the end justifies the means and they will do whatever is necessary to have their new world order. Their one world totalitarian socialist government. They are the Nazis. And you had better understand that, ladies and gentlemen. You'd better get it through your head. If there's anybody out there who's a loyal patriot, who has any doubts whatsoever, 
just listen. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. John McGaw, the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, has just made a liar out of a lot of people in government and has just verified verified the investigations of all of us who have been telling you ever since it happened who burned down Mount Carmel and it was not the Branch Davidians at all it doesn't take a rocket scientist ladies and gentlemen to understand this simple statement made by the man at the top who should know the man who started the whole thing he wants us to believe that he had nothing to do with the ending he's blaming it on the Federal Bureau of Investigation I say bullshit I say that he was just as much responsible and just as much involved. The Federal Bureau of Investigation claims they didn't come in until the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms screwed it all up. But I got news for you folks. They were on the scene from the beginning, from the very beginning. They were there, along with military personnel, National Guard personnel, people from the British SAS, Interpol. United States Army Psychological Operations Units. The Texas Rangers. The Sheriff's Department. The local police. This was no little bitty action to serve a warrant. This was a premeditated attack to kill those people to wipe them out as an object lesson to anybody else in this country who would stockpile weapons which by the way regardless of all that you've heard on the news regardless of all the little chit chatting of the puppets at six o'clock across the country is not illegal at all never has been and until they do something about the second article in amendment to the Constitution for the United States of America never can be all gun laws are unconstitutional illegal and unlawful I don't care who passed them or what they say or how they pretend to justify it until they handle the second article in amendment they are all unconstitutional and therefore illegal and unlawful the active clause in the second article amendment is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed now I ask you mr. John McGaw mr. Bill Clinton mr. free I don't know how you got a name like free since you're such a Nazi I ask you all, what part of shall not be infringed do you not understand? What is it about the word people that so confuses you? Why is it that you cannot understand the word right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed my daughter is five years old she understands it perfectly why is it that grown men have so much trouble could it be that it's not their trouble that they're having understanding these words but it is their agenda that gets in their way their agenda is total and absolute control over every single person upon the face of this earth. And to do that, they cannot allow anyone to possess firearms.
And that is really what's behind all of this. Waco was an object lesson to the sheeple of the world. And since we don't talk to the sheeple anymore, I'm not going to expound upon that. Patriots, intelligent people, people who understand the principles and ideals upon which this nation was founded, must not only understand it, but feel it in their heart. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. Now, folks, I'm going to... Uh, Read you a little story here. That's very good. Comes from Dave Delaney of Dave Delaney's Freedom House, and uh, he puts out some pretty good stuff. So I recommend if you want to subscribe to Dave Delaney's Freedom House excerpts, send a uh, postcard, or excuse me, send a letter with a donation to cover printing, mail, and other costs. The recommended donation for a whole year is $20 to Dave Delaney's Freedom House, Post Office Box 212, Conklin, spelled C-O-N-K-L-I-N, New York, 13748. That's Dave Delaney's Freedom House, Post Office Box 212, Conklin, New York, 13748. Send your address. Request a uh, subscription to Dave Delaney's Freedom House newsletter. It's a monthly publication. And uh, include a donation to cover printing, mail, and other costs. The recommended donation is $20 a year. And send it to Dave Delaney's Freedom House, PO Box 212, Conklin, New York, 13748. Now, once you hear this, I think that you'll you'll want to subscribe. I've read an awful lot of his material that he posts on the Internet, and I've enjoyed every single word of it. He's a very intelligent, a very good writer, and he addresses in a down-home way the issue of liberty like no other. This is entitled... An armed neighborhood. And it goes like this. Last week, my cat, cat, met the neighbor's dog, dog. <laughs> cat is a black male, six pounds. The dog is a male collie, 70 pounds. I was indoors and heard one orchestrated yelp and hissing meow. I went out to check on things. Cat was arced so severely I thought his spine would snap. The collie was 20 feet away, feet splayed, teeth bared. And as I watched, the arc disappeared. The collie stood, and the two of them walked away. There hasn't been an objection from either of them since. They get along just fine. Relating this story to a friend, he reminded me that an armed neighborhood is a polite neighborhood. And there has been a silly grin on my face ever since. It took all of one minute to convince these two lords that they were going to share their two-acre kingdom. It's evident that these two have nothing to fear from one another. The dog still hunts squirrels and rabbits, and the cat still hunts birds and field mice. And now they often walk together. But I will bet you dollars to donuts I never see either one stealing from the other's food dish. Quote, Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and seize his goods, except he shall first bind the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? End quote. One of the interesting things about Jesus' examples and illustrations is that they clearly makes sense. This one from Matthew in the New Testament is as appropriate today as it was 2,000 years ago. And it was certainly no less appropriate 200 years ago. It is not insignificant 
that the United States Constitution contains a stated right pulled from the hundreds of implicit rights that says it is good and well for a people to have arms to protect themselves. The ridiculous argument that this applies only to the army would be a good joke if it wasn't spoken of so seriously. Can you imagine a people so naive that they would feel the need to write that the army must be armed? <laughs> of course, every organized army is armed. And that was precisely why the founders felt that we the people must be armed. As in court, as in government, so in battle. The people must be the strongest defense and the final wall that evil must scale. It is the natural right of man. Quote, A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. End quote. Second article in amendment, Constitution for the United States of America. It wasn't only an idea of the Founding Fathers. Preserving our possessions and maintaining our arms is as old as man. The unique posture of the early American establishment was that this right of kings was no right of kings at all. It was and is the right of the people. The founders knew that a large state-sponsored militia would be loyal to the state, so they wrote the Constitution to forbid standing armies. At the same time, they said that every man may, and should by design, be willing and able to protect himself, his family, his rights, his community, and his state. Keeping and bearing arms is not the means of protection. The Republic is the means. Law is the means. Arms are not to establish or create justice. They are to protect it and preserve it. They are the last resort when the law is being thoroughly and otherwise helplessly violated. Signed, Dave Delaney. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. Ladies and gentlemen, the hour of the time is brought to you by my good friend, Craig Smith, and all the good, wonderful people that work with him down at Swiss America Trading in Phoenix. The only thing I don't like about Swiss America Trading is that it is in Phoenix, and in the summertime, well, the last time that we were down there, it was 120 degrees measured at Sky Harbor Airport. I actually think it was 121 or 122, uh, but just to make sure, 
that I don't tell you a lie, I know that it was 120 degrees. No doubt whatsoever. That night in the hotel room, the power failed and uh, nobody could sleep. Nobody could breathe, <laughs> in fact. That's how hot it is at night. But never mind the heat. You see, the people that can't stand the heat get out of the kitchen, and I'm one of them. I don't live in Phoenix, but Craig and Gene Miller and all of those other people down there, Steve, Joanne, Craig's secretary, wonderful woman, they do. And they take care of our interests in the precious metal category. Now, I'm intentionally slowing down a bit here because I want you to get the message. I want you to understand. Craig believes as I do. Somebody once called me and said, uh, you know, you told me once that Craig was a Christian, and I called up, and this guy that was uh, talking to me is a Jewish guy. I said, so? He said, well, what's he doing in a Christian office? I said, what are you doing in a free country? Don't you understand liberty? Let me spell it for you. L, capital L, that is. You should always spell liberty and freedom with capital F and capital L. Capital L-I-B-E-R-T-Y. Liberty. Yes, Craig's a Christian, but he's an American Christian. He understands the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. That's why he sponsors this broadcast. He understands my message. He understands what liberty truly means. Our forefathers created this nation to escape from persecution, ladies and gentlemen. They created real money for us to use so that we could not be enslaved as people were being enslaved in Europe with phony money, being destroyed with paper money. They created the government as a secular government. The government could no more be Christian than this wall that I'm looking at. The government is not a person. It doesn't have a mind. It reflects, of course, the morals and the religious beliefs of those who created it. But the government is a secular organization. And they created it in that manner so that all peoples in this country could be free and safe from persecution because of their beliefs and because of the altar upon which they worshipped. All of our forefathers, all of them, were considered to be screwballs, lunatics, traitors, Compared to the European point of view, they were extremely liberal. Compared to our point of view today, they were extremely conservative. George Washington, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, all of them, all of them, ladies and gentlemen, were criminals, traitors. They were hunted by the crown. It's strange that people today don't understand our forefathers and what they were doing. They were trying to create a nation where they could do and say what they wanted to do and say and worship the God of their choice, whatever that God happened to be. And regardless of what you've been taught, most of our founding fathers were deists, not Christians. And that's clear. In history, it's clear in their own writings. They did believe in morals. They did believe that man had to recognize something higher than himself. They understood the trap that man could fall into by believing that he was God. And so, yes, an awful lot of what they believed what the general population believed at that time is reflected 
in the Constitution and in the government. But the government and the Constitution are not Christians. They don't go to church on Sunday. They can't think. The government is limited by the Constitution to protect our right to be Christian or to be Muslim or to be Jewish or to be Buddhist or to be an atheist. Craig knows that, and that's why when you call up to talk to somebody at Swiss Marriage Trading, you might get a Jewish person. You might get somebody who doesn't believe in God at all. Oh, that's very rare. I haven't met anyone there yet who doesn't believe in God. You could even get a Buddhist. If you Craig hires people according to their character, according to their ability to do the job, According to their willingness to be friendly and deal honestly with the customers so that it doesn't cause me or Craig or you any problems. And so I was really upset with this caller who said, uh, gee, you know, he said Craig was a Christian. I called and talked to a Jewish fellow. So what? <laughs> this is America. Welcome. Did you just get off the boat? Craig guarantees what they do down there. In fact, they record everything so that nobody can lie to you. All we have to do is play the tape back and we can catch them in their lie. On the other side of the coin, you can't lie about the conversation or what happened or transpired there either. Because the same thing applies. And they have a buyback policy, folks. Nobody else does. And they'll tell you all about it. All you have to do is ask them. And not only does Craig guarantee his work, and they record everything, they have a buyback policy, I guarantee it. If anything goes wrong, if you don't think you were treated right, if you think you were taken advantage of or lied to or anything, call me. I'll take care of it. I promise you that. We'll get to the bottom of it. To everybody's satisfaction. Nobody's going to be cheated by any sponsor of this broadcast as long as I'm alive. Craig wouldn't do that. I know him. Swiss Merch Trading wouldn't do that. I know them. And the company reflects the man's principles who owns it. And that's Craig Smith. And he really does care. So, if you'd like to get your hands on some real money, and folks, I highly recommend it. You all know, who listen to this broadcast, what you need to do to get ready for what's coming. And you know it's coming. And if you haven't done it, you are being irresponsible to yourself and to your family. So, I want you to call Swiss America Trading. 1-800-289-2646, or if it's easier to remember, 1-800-BUY-COIN. Tell them that you're a listener to the Hour of the Time, that Bill Cooper sent you, and that you want to know how you can get your hands on some real money. And if you don't like the plans that they discuss with you, come up with one of your own. Offer them an alternative. Ask questions. Don't be timid. It's no different than going to the market for a loaf of bread. Now you'll find somebody somewhere who will sell you precious metals cheaper. But they won't be as honest. They won't record everything. They won't give you a buyback policy. They won't guarantee your work. I won't guarantee their work. And you can't be absolutely sure that what you're getting is what has been represented. And you'll be dealing with somebody who did not bring you the hour of the time. And I think you'd better think about that. And one of the reasons why Smith's America Trading's prices are like they are is because he takes a tremendous loss backing this broadcast, folks. It takes a lot of guts to put a company behind what I say on the air. It takes a hell of a lot of guts. And it automatically 
costs him the business of every socialist and every liberal in this country, which is a lot of business. So think about that before you go off to shave a couple of bucks off a gold coin. Patriots are notorious for not backing their own causes. Patriots, with all their bantering about being loyal to the Constitution, are not loyal to those on the front lines who fight the battle. Not all patriots, but enough to make a big difference. And that's one of the reasons why we find ourselves in the positions that we do. So call Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646, folks, and do it now. Do it right this very minute. Because you know that we all tend to procrastinate, me included. <laughs> I can tell you about some of the times that I waited until I got in front of the microphone before I even decided what I was going to talk about on the broadcast. <laughs> You'd probably roll over laughing. 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. You'll be glad that you did. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in big, big trouble. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. Now, I know that there are many of you out there who are patriots who have been studying what's going on for a long time and you know something's wrong. And you know we're headed in the wrong direction. But you just can't understand how there could be a concerted effort, a plan, going back many, many years, to bring about a new world order, a one world government. So let me sort of help you get over that hurdle. I'm going to read to you an article from the New York Times, October the 6th, 1940. That's right. From the New York Times, October the 6th, 1940. Now, the title of this article, or the headline, so to speak, is this. Listen carefully. Quote, New World Order Pledged to Jews. Arthur Greenwood of British War Cabinet sends message of assurance here. Writing of wrongs seen. English rabbi delivers to Dr. R.S. Wise new statement on question after war, end quote. Now, I want you all to understand that this was the British government making a promise to the Jews of the world that after the war is over, there would be a new world order. It wasn't promised to the Jews to lead it, or own it, or control it. The pledge was given to the Jews of the world that there would be a new world order after the war. 
This pledge was made by Arthur Greenwood of British War Cabinet. And the English rabbi delivered this message to Dr. R.S. Wise in the United States. And it was published in the New York Times, October the 6th, 1940. And I'm going to read it to you. I want you to listen very carefully so that you'll understand. This is an old, old plan, ladies and gentlemen. And I quote, In the first public declaration on the Jewish question since the outbreak of the war, Arthur Greenwood, member without portfolio in the British War Cabinet, assured the Jews of the United States that when victory was achieved, an effort would be made to found a new world order based on the ideals of justice and peace. Mr. Greenwood, who is deputy leader of the British Labour Party, declared that in the new world, the conscience of civilized humanity would demand that the wrongs suffered by the Jewish people in so many centuries, in so many countries, should be righted. He added that after the war, an opportunity would be given to Jews everywhere to make a distinctive and constructive contribution in this rebuilding of the world. The message was delivered last week to Dr. Stephen E. Wise, excuse me, Stephen S. Wise, that's Dr. Stephen S. Wise, Chairman of the Executive Committee of the World Jewish Congress by Rabbi Maurice L. Pereswig, Chairman of the British Section of the Congress. And this part is uh, not clear, ladies and gentlemen. Rabbi, let me see. What is his name here? The rabbi, <laughs> it's very difficult to read. The rabbi arrived from England Monday evening. Comparing the statement with the Balfour Declaration of 1917, Dr. Wise declared that in a sense it had wider and farther reaching implications, as it dealt with the status of Jews throughout the world. He said that Mr. Greenwood's message could be interpreted as a statement of England's firm intention to help right the wrongs which Jews have suffered and continue to suffer today because of Hitler's disorder and lawlessness. Mr. Greenwood, sending the Jews of America a message of encouragement and warm good wishes, wrote, quote, the tragic fate of the Jewish victims of Nazi tyranny has, as you know, filled us with a deep emotion. The speeches of responsible statesmen in Parliament and at the League of Nations during the last seven years have reflected the horror with which the people of this country have viewed the Nazi relapse into barbarism. The British government sought again to secure some amelioration of the lot of persecuted Jewry, both in Germany itself and in the countries which were infected by the Nazi doctrine of racial hatred, and today the same sinister power which has trampled on its own defenseless minorities, and by fraud and force has temporarily robbed many small peoples of their independence, has challenged the last stronghold of liberty in Europe. When we have achieved victory, as we assuredly shall, the nations will have the opportunity of establishing a, quote, new world order, end quote, based on the ideals of justice and peace. In such a world, it is our confident hope that the conscience of civilized humanity would demand that the wrongs suffered by the Jewish people in so many countries should be righted. In the rebuilding of civilized society after the war, there should and will be a real opportunity for Jews everywhere to make a distinctive and constructive contribution. And all men of goodwill must assuredly hope that in New Europe, the Jewish people, in whatever country they may live, will have freedom 
and full equality before the law with every other citizen. End quote. In an interview at the Hotel Astor, Rabbi Periswig declared he was certain Mr. Greenwood speaks for England. There is a clear realization, he added, that freedom and emancipation for the Jewish people are tied up with the emancipation and freedom for people everywhere. The message, Rabbi Periswig remarked, was the subject of earnest consideration by the British government. Quote, This is a declaration in behalf of the whole world, he observed. Here the British government expresses clearly what it hopes will take place after the war is won. End quote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> let me tell you how clearly they perceived what would happen after the war was won. We have a map that was drawn up in New York in 1942. On this map, it clearly shows the partition of Europe and the world, in fact, post-war exactly the way it happened. It also shows a new country in the Middle East which on the map is not called Israel, but is called Hebrew land. So it is clear that this New World Order idea is very old. It's older than World War II. In fact, World War II was fought with the hopes of causing enough bloodshed and carnage to frighten the world into accepting world government under the United Nations, which, by the way, was created in 1941. If you want to know the truth, Dwight David Eisenhower was the first Secretary General of the United Nations. And all this will be coming out in my new book when it's published soon, I hope. I'm almost finished with it. And in the pages of Veritas, and those of you who have been listening to The Hour of the Time for the last four years, you've already heard most of it. And it's been documented by me and double-checked by thousands and maybe tens of thousands of you. Many of you trying and hoping to prove me wrong. And in the effort, you have become staunch allies and strong patriots. And you're able to talk to other people with proof in your hands. And that is absolutely necessary. You must have the proof in your hands in order to deal with some of these people out there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is imperative that you understand that you must, for the sake of all of us, either seek out and join or form a militia. Arm yourselves and prepare yourselves and your family and your communities. For just as sure as I live. I believe that um, had we been left in charge of um, uh, the Waco incident, um, uh, we would not have burned that building. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless you all.
Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our full power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.